I'll go ahead and, and start the session with you guys. Um, what I'll do is I'm actually gonna read out the, um, the bios on, on the panelists. So it'll make it so that if folks are trickling in, um, I'll still be talking for the next couple of minutes. So I think that's okay if you get to hear my voice for just a little while. And then we'll transition on to our speakers and some, some fantastic questions that we have in the queue for them. Um, I'm Dr. Vanessa lopez Littleton. I'm your host for today, and so welcome to another crucial conversation. I want to take just a brief moment to acknowledge that this panel continues in the tradition that you've experienced here um, this week of having masterful speakers who challenge us to think about the societies in which we live, learn, work, and play. And so I'm excited about this panel because I get to share um, just a little bit of time with my colleagues from across the US speaking on issues that are important to each of us um, for very important reasons. And for me, really, that's really about advancing us towards a more just and equitable society. So we're all doing the work that we're gonna be talking about today. We're all connected because of our passion, our scholarship, and more importantly, our skills in doing the, the work that's necessary to transform our society. And so before we begin, I do wanna spend just a little bit of time about telling you who our panelists are for today. And so first up, we have Dr. Aaron C. Rollins, Jr. He is the department chair of urban and public affairs and the director of the Masters of Public Administration program at the University of Louisville. His research focuses on issues pertaining to cultural competency, social equity, mediation, and conflict resolution, and also organizational effectiveness. His teaching and scholarship are blazing new trails in the areas of urban and public policy. We're also honored to have Dr. Rashmi Chordia, who is an assistant professor of public administration at Seattle University's Institute of Public Service. Her teaching scholarship and practice philosophy are anchored in doing the work of integrating inner change and collective change for social justice and collective liberation. She approaches her work from a trauma-informed, healing-centered lens of embodied social justice that is caring and intentional about centering the margins. Such important work. Dr. Nuri Heckler, he is an assistant professor in the School of Public Administration at the University of Nebraska of Omaha, I'm sorry, at Omaha. His research on critical race theory and multiple masculinity studies has been published in numerous public administration and law, law journals. He focused his research on whiteness and masculinity in public organizations, including nonprofits, social enterprise, and governments. Dr. Sean McCandless, works as an assistant professor and as an associate director of the, direct, of the Doctorate of Public Administration program at the University of Illinois Springfield. His research examines how accountability for social equity is achieved. With Dr. Mary Guy, he is the co-editor of the book, Achieving Social Equity from, from Problems to Solutions. And then with Dr. Susan Gooden and Dr. Richard Gregory, Johnson III, he is the co-founder of the Journal of Social Equity and Public Administration. So go Giuseppe. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, I am Dr. Vanessa Lopez Littleton. I am an Associate Professor of Public Administration and Nonprofit Management. I'm also the Department Chair of the Department of Health, Human Services and Public Policy at California State University, Monterey Bay. My area of expertise is health equity and seeking solutions to problems that are rooted in the connection between health and social factors, in particular racism and other forms of bias and discrimination. My latest study is examining vaccine hesitancy in the black population in Monterey County. And so before we get started today, I do wanna take up just a little bit of more, a little time to ensure that we have a firm grounding in what critical race theory really is. You'll hear us refer to critical race theory as CRT. We promise not to overuse acronyms without careful explanations, but I did want to say that. And so um, for many of us, we know that CRT has been around for a very long time, but recently it's come under attack by policymakers and others who view CRT as a threat. And so that's the reason we felt like this um, 
conversation was just so necessary and important for us to do at this particular conference. So as we know, CRT is both an academic and a legal concept that emerged out of the 70s and 80s by legal scholars such as Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, and Richard Delgado and others. It is the confluence of critical legal studies and radical feminism. And it grew out of this need to find a theoretical framework that could explain the relationship between race, racism, and power. And there is an intent there that they really wanted to begin to think of ways to transform systems that produce these different outcomes. So really trying to understand why so many black people were being locked up and imprisoned within these systems. So this is really a, a framework that helps us to not only understand, but actually contextualizes some of the problems that we're having. So CRT recognizes that racism is a system of oppression and that this is not about individual level biases and prejudices. Instead, this is really about racism in the United States and other systems that's embedded and that's been codified into our laws, our policies and our institution. And as a result of that racism, we get these types of inequalities, we get these disparate outcomes. So when we're talking about um, the exposure to police violence, morbidity and mortality rates for black Americans, um, educational outcomes, um, the, the poor survival rates of black infants, and we could go on and on. I could talk all day about the differences that we face in our society. So CRT really creates a lens through which we can look to view to really understand these differences. I'm gonna cover these five tenets of CRT so that we'll, we'll have them out of the way and my colleagues don't have to kind of go there unless they choose to, right? Um, but um, so some of the tenets are principles of critical race theory is that race is not a biological construct, right? It's something that's socially constructed, but it's also socially significant, which means it has an important role to play within our society. And so it also says that racism is a system of structuring opportunities that's embedded within these systems, institutions, and also our policies. And then the third one is that this notion that racism is codified, deeply entrenched in these systems and policies, and it serves a purpose of reinforcing these inequalities. So it's not that these things are done and there's no intent, there's no rationale, it, it doesn't have an impact, it doesn't have a consequence because we know that it does. And then as a result, the fourth one is there's a need for these counter narratives. There's a need for people of color to be able to be deemed as ex or experts, to be able to do storytelling in order to reject these kind of um, ideas about what black people and what people of color really are. So this deficit informed research that typically exclude these different epistemologies of people of color, we wanna make sure that we reject those um, that we've so often normalized in our society. And then the last one really centers on the work of, of Kimberly Crenshaw, where she really focused on intersectionality, recognizing that these social identities do not exist independent of each other, but actually work together in a, to form a system of oppression. So CRT and CRT scholars really challenge us to grapple with the structuring of society um, in, in getting to these um, notions that we need to be able to disrupt these systems in order to create differential change. And so while I could speak on this for hours, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop my comments now and I'm gonna invite my colleagues into this discussion. And my first question is a very broad opening um, question that allows them to let you know a little bit about who they are and what brings them to this work, right? So the first question is about connections. What is your connection to critical race theory? And what do you view as the pressing need for critical theories in a critical theorist in the area of public administration? And I'm gonna invite my, my, my colleague, my esteemed colleague that I'm actually just getting to, to be able to know, um, Dr. Cordia, I'll invite her to, to give her comments first. <clears throat> Thanks, Dr. Vanessa Lopez Little, Littleton. Oh, yeah. um, thank you for the invitation. And uh, before I begin to offer my comments, I just want to invite everyone who's present in this Zoom space 
Um, I want to acknowledge that talking about race, talking about race theory, critical race theory, talking about racism, racialization can evoke all sorts of um, physical and bodily responses. And so I want to invite all of us to do what we need to do to uh, stay engaged, or even if it means to disengage momentarily and then come back. Uh, so be as best as you can. And invitation for me as well to be mindful of um, our bodies as we have these conversations, because it's not just analysis, it's life for many of us. So I want to acknowledge that. And if it does arouse any strong emotions, um, whether it's activation or despair, any sorts of emotions, all of those are welcome. Please um, acknowledge them. And if you need to ground yourself, do whatever you need to ground yourself as we move through this conversation. Um, thank you for that question, um, Vanessa. I was reflecting on um, the question that you pose, um, how am I engaged in this work and what brings me to this work? I can I need to start with this acknowledgement that as made in India, as I like to say, I'm a made in India, global citizen, um, non-Dalit, non-Indigenous woman of color. I hold these both oppressed and oppressor identities and that I constantly have to navigate critically and being critically conscious of those identities. So I enter into this conversation as an uh, currently able-bodied, um, able body, able mind um, with those oppressed oppressor identities as a woman of color into this conversation, acknowledging my privilege and um, areas where I may have internalized oppression or may hold these um, subordinate disadvantaged identities too. Um, I was reflecting on your question and um, uh, thinking about Bell Hooks's work, Teaching to Transgress her book, Teaching to Transgress, and she reflects on how theories can be when we use them with that intentionality, they have this potential to become um, a source of healing, a source of liberation when we use it in that direction. It can become a source of micro-empowerment, micro-emancipation. And um, as a social justice educator, I... I'm seeking and constantly recommitting myself to deepening my practice of trauma-informed, healing-centered learning that centers the margins. So at the core of my social justice philosophy is this discernment that I'm able to have from the movement's work that social justice at its core is healing justice. So like Bell Hooks notes, um, education being a liberatory practice, I understand that classrooms and our institutions of learning, higher education can become sites of healing if we use them in that direction. And so theories can become the source of healing because they help us make sense of the world. And most importantly, they help us tell the truth, the truth that you um, beautifully explained at the right at the beginning, that we all hold these multiple truths and those truths need to be told in stories and through lived experiences and that they have value. So critical race theory is at the core of my pedagogy and shapes and influences and guides my teaching philosophy. And I seek to use critical race theory not only for analysis of our contemporary institutional, interpersonal, intrapersonal, like the introspection piece, that inner change work piece, all those problems, the systemic problems, but also as a philosophy of teaching towards decolonized educational education that first acknowledges hopefully disrupts and dismantles hierarchies that are present even within our classrooms and in our all our different structures so that I can cultivate a safe enough space for my students and me, for this collective learning community that I hold often, space for analysis that helps us make sense of the world around us and how we navigate that world from these different locations of advantage and disadvantage. I'll close by saying this, critical race theory guides me in this discernment and recognition that trauma 
of social injustices, of racism, that is historical, Resma Manikam's work, that trauma is historical, intergenerational, it's persistent institutional and personal trauma. It is collective trauma that we hold and that energy shows up in all our spaces if we are aware of that. And so healing needs to happen both individually and collectively. And in this work, if we care about the values, about our mission, about our um, the things that we really care about um, from a non-extractive, from a decolonized perspective, um, critical race theory really helps in building those foundations for that work to emerge, for that healing to emerge, for the truth to be told. Um, I'll pause here for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that that powerful commentary. Um, I I so look forward to working with you. I just wrote a book chapter on racial trauma um, in education, and so I know that um, our work is going to be in total alignment. And this is a thought and thinking about the body and stress and what racism does and how those internalized stressors actually build up. And it's not an individual thing, it's a collective, it's a community impact that it has. So I'm looking forward to working with you, girl. Everything happens for a reason. So I'm glad we're on this panel together, holding space together. Um, I would love to invite um, Dr. Rollins to the to the conversation. So Dr. Rollins, if you wanna unmute and no, respond very to the good. question. I, yeah, I'm with you as well. It, it, that was very, <laughs> it was enlightening to me as well. So as a child, I was introduced to this. As a child, I um, was introduced to Langston Hughes' poem, Let America Be America Again, in which he said, you know, America never was America to me. And, and I, I felt that, I really embodied that, I believed that. And then later on, as King said, in one of his lesser known speeches, King talked about the other America. And he talked about how there, there are two Americas, you know, there's one that's flowing with fruit and beautiful, and then there's another America. Uh, and, and so that's how I kind of, I, I knew, I read and I went to a predominantly white school in Mississippi. It was the, the top public education uh, system, school in the system in the state. And I uh, learned and I saw the way my colleagues and my uh, classmates were living and the way I was living. And I realized that there are two Americas. There are two different things going on here at the same time. So I became interested in it. And I really, after that became very interested. And I, I noticed being from Mississippi, that race was the most salient issue around me. It was the most salient issue around me. And, and as a critical start learning and reading critical race theory, I soon learned that racism was the precursor to race. So race is the most salient issue, but racism is the precursor to race. And, and when you start going and diving deep, deep into that, I started reading the bell hooks and the uh, other individuals, the, the Patricia Hill Collins and some of the others. And, that's what really, really brought me into this space. And, and I just fell in love with it. I can't wait to have this conversation with the other panelists as we continue. Yeah, thank you so much. Cause I wanna hear more about it being the precursor, right? Cause that's challenging the way that a lot of us think about racism being a byproduct of race, but we'll get it, we'll get it. I love that. So Dr. Heckler, I would love to invite you to this conversation as well. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone for inviting me. Uh, this is just such a wonderful conference and it's uh, great to be here. I wish I had more time this year to spend uh, here, but I'm in the middle of a big move. Um, and I, it's just really great to be talking about this. It's been such an important part of my education. Um, I was introduced to critical race theory in law school, um, where we were thinking about how the law operates when it's operating in its sort of normal, ordinary way, it's operating in a way that's fundamentally racist, right? And so we look into things as just innocuous as property law and how you, you know, buy a toothbrush and how that, even that is built up in this system of race for so long that it is racist because as Dr. Rollins, so, uh, elegantly pointed out, eloquently pointed out that racism is at the heart of race, not the other way around. Um, and so I, I, I was lucky enough to just randomly have happened into a critical race school at um, uh, University of Denver. Uh, my first professor was uh, uh, in critical race was Robert Chang, who's one of the four fathers of Asian Americans in the law, which is the critical race theory branch that looks at Asian Americans. Um, and I had just the pleasure of him assigning me work, right? And it wasn't just 
reading work. It was self work. Um, it was me sort of coming out of my, what I call my progressive mind and starting to think about race in a way that actually centers race and thinks about race as a uh, this fundamental structure that's built into the American, the Anglo legal system, really. Um, and that is, when you think about it, that's uh, when, when I started thinking about it, it really occurred to me that this was a form of, of, of violence. It was this way of ripping away so much of the world's knowledge um, and denying it to everyone. In, in, and when we couldn't get rid of the knowledge, we would get rid of the bodies who, who carried that knowledge with them, right? Or control them, imprison them, enslave them, or burn them, or, or, or hang them, right? It was, it was this utter violence. Um, and uh, to have that violence um, put into a frame that could be understood and made sense of that's how, that's the importance of critical race theory and of, of really sticking true to that idea that racism is the ordinary course of law, it's the ordinary course of public administration. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. McCandless, you there? I wanna hear from you. Excellent. Well, it's so great to be on this panel and it's so great to see everyone. And, it, and my connection to it is that I have found it to be an indispensable tool in, in the classroom, in research, in service, and even in my interpersonal relationships. And, and I've um, um, incorporated um, CRT, critical race theory, um, across these dimensions, you know, for, for, for decades, actually, because I think at its core to, 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 get, to get to that question, it is a powerful tool to understand the causes and effects of inequities and injustices and to inform ways to promote better public service for all. And I, I think I really need to be this very bluntly about this. Um, There's so many inaccuracies about CRT in the media. I know we're gonna talk about this a little later and I do need to point out CRT is not anti-white and it's not anti-constitutional. Uh, again, we'll be talking about this later. And, and I wanna give you two quotations about the power of CRT to do these things. And one of course is from uh, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw we've been mentioning and quote, she says, it's a way of seeing, attending to, accounting for, tracing and analyzing the ways that race is produced the way that racial inequality facilitated and the ways that our history has created these inequalities that now can be almost effortlessly reproduced unless we attend to the existence of these inequalities. And one more from Mari Matsada, um, a law professor at the University of Hawaii, who said, the problem is not bad people, the problem is a system that reproduces bad outcomes. It is both humane and inclusive to say, we have done things that have hurt all of us and we need to find a way out. And I think these are these quotations are powerful, they're compassionate, they're ethical, and they're empathetic, because public administration, especially with its, uh, is a field with a heavily application um, aspect, is supposed to be about improving people's lives. We have four pillars that say that public service is supposed to be efficient, effective, economical, and equitable. And so we need tools to explain when these goals are met, when they're not met, and how to meet these goals. And so we need CRT because it focuses on describing and explaining the how and why of the existence of inequities. It puts these in the context of systems and ideas and actions. And, and I think it's helpful to, to take a step back to, to, to realize that um, you know, Woolridge and Gooden in 2009, they offered a, they authored a great piece in administrative theory and praxis that's titled The Epic of Social Equity. And they note how social equity is both empirical, uh, scientific dimensions, as well as normative dimensions. And CRT is essential for both because theories are among the most useful things we have, among the useful things we know because at their core, they're explanations of how and why something works the way that it does. It's taking a body of evidence, experience, and providing investigable assertions and explanations about how, why it works the way that it does. And then critical theories even go a step further by saying, well, here are, are these diagnoses of the issues. Here's how we can inform things could be made more equitable. So again, it, it's an invaluable tool. And I'll just, I'll just be very quick here in, in wrapping this up because we have this critical we have this need for critical race theory because of some big questions that are enduring in PA and I was thinking you know how do we put this into the lexicon of PA particularly about social equity in PA and and I think it can be 
summarized a fair portion in questions like like this like like for instance why do black people indigenous people and people of color seem to disproportionately face issues related to access to public services processes involved in the creation of those public services the quality of those services and the outcomes of those services and, and we've seen numerous examples of this um, you know across history but including most recently in the um in the COVID-19 pandemic, these, these issues of inequities about access to reliable information, access to technology, access to life-saving vaccines, and so forth. Um, and that's the first thing that critical race theory does for us, gives explanations about the existence of those injustices. Then it does another thing by, by um, empirically um, demonstrating that these are due to disparities. These are not just issues that happen, they're deeply embedded, systemic bias, prejudice, and discrimination. And and I think it's important for for me to be also blunt about this is that I'm have to, I'm you know I'm experiencing nervousness about about many of these conversations. Susan Gooden wrote Social Equity, uh, Race and Social Equity, a Nervous Area of Government, and, and she opens the book by discussing what happens when you get nervous. You sweat, your heart beats faster. You may even avoid certain uh, situations because you don't want to be nervous. And so there is a nervousness to admitting that these inequities and injustices are there. That policies and administrative actions have been explicitly designed to marginalize some and benefit others and then also that there is an insidiousness to this conversation and that you know even if um, we, we have had a lot of constitutional advancements legal advancements there are still inequities um, and disparities and injustices that we have to talk about we have to admit if we, anything is ever going to get better and i'll just end um, with this it's that critical aspect also informs that if we can diagnose these issues, if we can have these explanations for how and why they occur and what these problems are, it begins to inform how we achieve things like accountability for social equity. And um, it really strikes that um, if we want things to get better, we um, not only, of course, have to change our own thinking, investigate our own privilege and use our own privilege, but then also um, admit that organizations are culpable in these injustices and that when we understand how they work, we can begin to promote um, fairness for all. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope y'all came to learn because this panel is bringing it, right? And so now we want to kind of switch and to really talk about some of the criticisms that have been levied at CRT. And so um, the question is, could you identify one criticism of CRT seen in public discourse and then offer a response to that criticism? And we're going to begin with Dr. Heckler. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think the criticism I'm going to take is that it is anti-white. And of course, I, my scholarship is on whiteness, um, and I am a, do consider myself a critical whiteness studies scholar. Um, and I, I think that it's fundamentally one of the a gift for, for white people, critical race theory, because no other theoretical construct in anywhere that I've looked in all my years of reading uh, uh, concepts of race has ever so succinctly separated white people from whiteness, right? White people are engaged in a system that's overwhelming them, that's that's overcoming them and that they are part of and that they participate in, uh, oftentimes malvolently, but starting with Du Bois, who is sort of a proto-critical race scholar, and definitely with Derrick Bell, we see over and over again that we are separating whiteness from white people. And that theoretical alignment allows white people to approach it as if um, we are being influenced by something that we can then attempt to stop. We can attempt to control rather than saying, oh, this is who I am, right? Or, um, or as I, I put it, you go from saying, um, I didn't mean to do that, right? And you're saying that a lot. Oh, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I didn't mean to hurt uh, or say something uh, offensive. And you can turn it around to saying, um, well, why did I do that, right? Uh, Lundy Bancroft does a certain sort of thing with masculinity, right? Um, but uh, when he's talking about he has a book called Why Did He Do That about abusers and why they engage with that. And that allows men to sort of separate themselves from their masculinity. What he does is he is a therapist who works with abusers, right? 
uh, domestic abusers. And we can see the same sort of work in the critical whiteness space where they're saying, well, why didn't we do that? And we can think about White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Uh, we can think about uh, White Rage by Anderson. Um, we can think about these books where it lets us know, oh, that's what's happening. And it's not, you know, it is white people obviously who are, who are engaging it, but it's a separation and we have control over it. And this gives us power, right? It gives us power over our, our situation, not white power as in racial power, right? It gives us control to stop the cycle of trauma. So that's why I'd say it's not into it. Yeah, thank you so much. You're so knowledgeable. I don't know if it's because you're a lawyer or just because you're really smart, but anyway, I always learn from you. Um, let's see, Dr. Rollins, you're up. Yes, and, and before I go, I'd like to say, uh, for those of you who don't have the chat option on, Jade is awesome. <laughs> Let me just say, turn your chat feature on right now because Jade is just hitting you with resource after resource after resource. Uh, and I don't know how, I think she's uh, hooked on my computer or something because she has some of the resources that I used as I was preparing my remarks. Dr. Um, Rollins, uh, this, this is why we keep Jade on. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she just constantly brings it, we love it. She, she, she's like, she, she's right here pulling my tabs. Uh, <laughs> but, but the one I would like to, um, uh, the, the criticism that I uh, hear often, and I'm in Kentucky, uh, now at the University of Louisville, and the ones we hear so often is that critical race theory is uh, training our, committed to training our children to hate America. Uh, and, and that's the one, and I won't uh, elaborate very much because I know some of the other panelists will talk on it, but my, my, my thoughts are very simple. You know, critical race theory teaches you to assess and give an accurate assessment of what America is, who America was, and what America can be. And, and I think it's just that simple. It, it's not even very difficult, and it, it forces us to have those uncomfortable conversations that Nuri was discussing, or that Sean was discussing, uh, uh, that Susan Gooden talked about in the book, you know, to have those tough conversations, those uncomfortable conversations with individuals who were taught a different, they were, they were taught a different narrative than I was taught, or, or we were probably taught the same narrative, but they have a different lived experience than I was, than I lived. So I think it forces us to have those uncomfortable conversations. But the one I'd like to focus on, or I'd like to put out there, is it teaches America children, it teaches us, to, um, teaches our children to hate America. And that's completely, uh, it's a complete myth and untrue. And I'll, I'll stop there and let others pick it back. All right, thanks so much. Um, Dr. McCandless, you're up. Well, I, I really appreciate uh, what uh, Dr. Hector and Dr. Rollins have, have mentioned here because I was really debating long and hard. What, there, there, there's so many um, criticism out there that are also um, just not grounded in, in facts. Um, and I decided that the one I'm going to focus on is um, the claim, like you see by um, certain organizations, that CRT is destructive and rejects the fundamental ideas on which our constitutional republic is based. That is, that it is against the, the U.S. Constitution and against U.S. institutions. And of course, I chose this one because um, I, I write a lot about uh, the Fourth Amendment and also the Fourteenth Amendment, so particularly the Due Process and Equal Protection Clauses, and and we see a, a bit of this uh, criticism out there um, represented in a few different ways, such as that CRT allegedly leads to um, other issues that 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 certain organizations uh, find reprehensible, like Black Lives Matter protests or LGBT clubs and schools or diversity trainings or or um, you know ethnic studies modeled curricula and even recently um, school shootings as well. All, all of these things that these organizations try to relate to one another. And of course, my overall point is that, of course, this, this uh, my response to this criticism is that no, CRT is not destructive and does not reject the fundamental ideas on which the Constitution is based. It, it, it offers a, a critique of our understanding of those. And here, here's what I mean by that. Because when we look at these constitutional and founding values, um, things that we're accustomed to talking about, like freedom and representation and limits on government power, like evident in the Bill of Rights, Again, this is uncomfortable to admit, they're intentionally excluded many on the basis of bias and prejudice. So these constitutional values are important, but we need to make them apply to everyone. They need to benefit everyone because historically, over the course of the United States, they were explicitly designed to exclude. And I'm reminded of, again, Susan, Susan Gooden, who um, we, um, 
uh, I, I wish we're here, but you know, she has a very, very, very important family event, wonderful. Um, she commented about how their social equity questions for US context are, what is the context of we, referencing the preamble of the US Constitution and how have definitions expanded? So think about this, this is something that, that CRT reminds about. Um, and the Constitution was being drafted in the late 1780s, who was among we the, we the people? You know, a property owning white men were we the people. And it reminds me of a line from George Orwell's Animal Farm where rights are increasingly made to benefit a few more th than anyone else. It says, well, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than the other, is a line from George Orwell's Animal Farm. And so what CRT points to is that the problem is not with these values of freedom and liberty and even limitations on government power, such as in the Bill of Rights. The issue has been, again, from the outset, they were explicitly meant and designed to privilege a select few. And we see this, of course, expanded. We see, you know, the, the 13th Amendment forbade slavery, except in instances of punishment for a crime. That's a key qualification there, which is why we see more movements at the local levels to, to have that, that last clause stricken. We have the 14th Amendment, which expanded the Bill of Rights to the states and equal protection, and the 15th Amendment, which expanded enfranchisement to all men, the 19th Amendment, which expanded enfranchisement to women. And then the 24th and the 26th that also um, lowered barriers as well. And there's also these laws that we have. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, rulings in Brown v. Board of Education, even Bostock v. Clayton County. And now we have workplace fairness. So they're saying, well, um, what? everything's getting fair. What's the problem? And what CRT reminds us is that it again points to that historical fact is that, yes, while there have been constitutional and legal and even societal advancements of it, um, these constitutional values have historically been meant to privilege the few. So who we as the people has, yes, expanded, but it still has a lot, a lot of ways to go. And I'm just gonna end with this because um, the reality is unfortunately these inequities exist, they persist and we need to be accountable for social equity. So these values, which are laudable, should be applied to all. And maybe even that we even need do new discourses to create these, uh, these newer values and have these discussions. And I'll just end there. Yeah, so thank you so much, um, Sean. So now we're up to the third question. And um, the question is um, about systemic change. And it asks, what role can white people play in developing strategies to dismantle systemic racism? Are they giving up something in working to disrupt these systems? And we're gonna start with a brother. So Dr. Rollins, you're up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had another question <laughs> I was uh teed up for. I'm sorry. Let me pull that one. You asked what role. Oh, oh, did I skip ahead? <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. I kind of like that okay, question. Okay, no, 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 but you. it's all right. I like oh, no. this. Let's get it. Let's get it. I, I just wasn't prepared for that one. I was prepared for another, but I, I have I have notes and all of them. We're ready. Oh, yeah. So, so very good. So I, um, one of the things, one, one of my favorite books uh, I've read in the, the last year or so, was Michael Eric Dyson's uh, Tears We Cannot Stop, Tears We Cannot Stop. And in his last chapter of that book, D Dyson, uh, uh, he introduced a term called IRA, Individual Reparation, uh, Individual Reparation Accounts, as a way of addressing, uh, as a way of addressing things we can do, uh, and things that white people can do. So I encourage all of you all to go and find that book and read the whole thing, but particularly focus on the white, on the last chapter. But in addition to that, uh, uh, one of the things that I've done and one of the things that I like to do in my classroom, I'm, I'm a provocative teacher and I like to do things that are, are, aren't normal, but I like to show videos like um, uh, Race the Power of an Illusion and assign works like Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow right before Thanksgiving, <laughs> right before Thanksgiving. And I tell the students uh, when that's our first week back, one of the things we're going to do is have a conversation. I want you to go home, have these conversations at home, because you can go into rooms that I can't go into. You're privy to places that I would never be privy to. So once you have you watch the video, let's discuss the new Jim Crow, and then go home and talk about it, and let's come back and have those conversations immediately following Thanksgiving. So I, I think one of the things that white people can do is go and have conversations in rooms and places that I would never have the opportunity to uh, to go, and with people I would never have the opportunity to talk to. All right, so do me a favor and, and loop back in to this question, which is about discuss one substantive way CRT could be incorporated into public service practice. And so whether that's a specific agency or across all of the public service sector. Sure. Am I, am I, 
Like, uh-huh, you know, you're up. Sure. Yeah. So, in, uh, right, right. So when Terry Cross was doing the cultural competency continuum, uh, I, I thought it was very interesting that he went past cultural competency. If those of us who are familiar with that, he went to an area called cultural proficiency. And in that, he noted that one of the things that we, we want to do and want to focus on is hire experts, not just a higher African-American or higher minority or higher whatever, but higher experts in this area. So one of the things, one substantive thing we can do is start to hire people who focus solely on these issues, solely on issues uh, uh, issues that we're fighting with. And then not only once you do that, but start to critically analyze your area and do assessment, do a racial assessment or diversity assessment of your agency, of your area. Uh, and if you can't do it, hire experts to come in and do an assessment. And give you uh give you an assessment. So it's a substantive thing that any agency can do, and, and most agencies should continue to do. So go to co- from culturally competent agency to a culturally proficient agency, uh, like Terry Cross in the continuum. Yeah, I love that. That's a, a a practical tool. I I would love to see it implemented more. So I'll invite um, Dr. McCandless to this conversation. And so on the main question, which is about the substantive way CRT could be incorporated. And then if you want to throw in what specifically white people can do to dismantle these systems. That, those are excellent questions, and I, and I think the way uh, I can answer it can, can answer both of those, and I'm taking a cue from Dr. Barry James and sharing uh, a link proactively there. So and again, thank you, Dr. Barry James, for sharing these, these wonderful resources. In terms of a substantive way, I mean, I, again, I debated what to talk about, um, you know, because there's so many options, trainings, changing mission statements, you know, there's many more. However, I think one of the things that, that critical race theory can particularly uh, inform is that we have to create um, meaningful institutionalized accountability structures. And there are ways uh, to do this. And, and um, I, was, I was thinking about the policing symposium and public administration review from a few years back. And, and Jennings and Rubido, if, if you read um, that um, special issue, they, they found evidence, for instance, that requiring paperwork documentation of instances of police pointing but not firing firearms seem to be associated with lower levels of gun deaths of civilians. And, and we were thinking, okay, well, Sean, why, why, why are you mentioning that in this context? But what things like that say is that findings point about how accountability can be institutionalized by explicitly requiring certain procedures. Um, not know if I want to, but this is an agency requirement because so much of what accountability is, is comes down to answerability, having to get reasons for acting, justifying behaviors, and even having corrective actions taken to remedy harm. And we want to take social equity series, we have to do this. So if you go to that link, um, I would really encourage um, everyone to, to read that because we, we don't have to um, invent or reinvent things. Organizations have been working on these, these substantive meaningful accountability mechanisms for decades, like the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GARE, um, some local jurisdictions like King County, who explicitly weave CRT principles into practice. And if you have the time, you know, again, stop, stop listening to what, to what I'm saying right now, and just go check this right out. But um, check out the appendices uh, within that document, because what you're going to see in these appendices, particularly racial equity toolkits, is that it mandates that individuals working in government assess the status quo of policies, initiative programs, and budgeting issues. They have assess inequities, propose changes, be accountable. In Appendix B, notice the amount of times in which it explicitly mandates stakeholder involvement, explicitly requiring determining benefits and burdens through racial equity analyses, accountability mechanisms for reporting, especially to communities. This is this is what we need. We need all of these things right there, but we have to build in these accountability structures and, and make them required, make them required for every single analysis about a policy change. The tools are out there. They just have to be applied like certain jurisdictions in the United States have applied and are beginning to see enormous success with using. Yeah, and thank you so much. white people should take help take the lead in, in promoting those things because as my good uh, friend, Dr. Jadis Mackey, the founder of the Young, Aspir- Young Aspiring Americans for Social and Political Activism, a Denver-based nonprofit, she says, it is owed, and of course, it is, it is up to white people to take the lead in dismantling these systems. So, trying to answer both in one. Okay, um, Dr. Cordia, I think I may have missed you for the last question. You want to chime in here? Sure. Um, maybe I could start with the question that you want. You seem to want to prioritize about the substantive issues. Um, I want to echo everything that my colleagues here have shared. And I want to build on what Dr. McCandless just shared, that white people need to take a lead. And 
want to add to that when we talk about leadership, um, lead other white people, <laughs> like black and brown indigenous people don't need um, white people to lead them. We need leadership within white affinity groups for BIPOC power. And I think that's the spirit of Dr. McCandless comment. And I want to reaffirm and reemphasize that, that we need leadership. And sometimes I feel that there is this dissonance that I want to lead. And then there are different messaging that stay in your lane, all sorts of things, all sorts of dynamics that happen, discerning and having that clarity that there's so much work that needs to be done as my other colleagues have shared, um, Dr. Rollins shared that where you have access, um, white students, white people, you have access to uh, places. And if, and I feel like even for organizations, that substantive piece, again, going back to that, the piece about inner change and collective change, I don't think we can just talk about race anytime. I think we need to be intentional. And I, I think it's so important to talk about race and racism. It's so important to talk about social injustices if we care about social equity and if we care about public service. And at the same time, we need to be careful and intentional that do I have the capacity to have this conversation? Have I built my organization's capacity to have this conversation in a way that is not re-traumatizing and re-wounding for people of color? And when that does inevitably happen, am I working towards building my capacity to do the work of repair? And somebody in the chat posted about restorative justice. That's so important in the way we approach this work. Um, so I wanna say that piece about first and foremost, is there this willingness to do the work? Check in, like, is this aligned with my values? Do I care about these values? How much do I care about these values? And that can lead to a lot of cognitive dissonance. Am I willing to stay? Can I build my capacity? Can I build my individual, my teams, my students, my classroom, my organization? Start small and grow infinitely. That's how I see social justice work, that it's not about doing it all together. It's not about um, devouring everything in one day. Bio, Akomal, I'm blanking on their last name, but this beautiful quote, I'll put it in chat. They said, times are urgent, we need to slow down. Times are urgent, we need to slow down. And urgency and scarcity are two prominent characteristics of white supremacy culture. So within our organizations, we care about doing this work intentionally. We need to be in this long-term and with sustainability. I wanna... Um, how organized, like helpful resources in thinking about doing this work. The first link I posted is uh, Taylor Cox's organizational change model. And I, what I take away from this is in public agencies, in higher education institutions, even within our classrooms, even as we build our critical pedagogies, um, am I in this work in long-term? Am I committed long-term? And I'm inevitably going to make mistakes. So that long-term working is integrated approach. It's not just doing trainings, not just doing unconscious bias trainings or diversity trainings, which is why it's getting a lot of criticism and bad rap in, um, in, 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 in radical uh, circles because it's not effective. It's done to support white comfort. And how do we shift away from white comfort to actually acknowledge tell the truth, like Desmond Tutu, ancestor Desmond Tutu talks about, we need to tell the truth first before we can reconcile, before we can do the work of repair. Uh, is my organization ready? If it is not, how do I build capacity uh, to do that change work? It might be Kurt Lewin's model, like it might be my organization may just need the work of unfreezing before that change can even emerge. Where am I? Where is my organization doing that work? And I offer the second resource, the 10 principles of disability justice, which are, I just love because those are my guiding principles. They are so intersectional and led by the, um, from the grassroots, from the disability justice movement, these 10 principles of disability justice, how can I, can I embody these principles to build a counter culture? Because the dominant culture is white supremacy culture. And I think we might, if we have time, we'll talk more about this, but that's the dominant culture. So how do I build counter cultures? How do I build counter narratives? And I hope to offer this resource to friends here, colleagues, siblings here, um, as we do this work collectively. I'll pause here. I have a lot to share, but I'm gonna, Restrain. <laughs>
Thank you. I know it's it's so hard. This is a great conversation. So thank you guys. Um, Dr. Heckler, you like to add anything? I'll try to make it quick. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Trivia, uh, Dr. Rollins, Dr. Again, this is a great conversation. Um, I uh, I think to build on Dr. Rollins' point on moving from cultural competency to cultural proficiency, the building block for that for a lot of folks is sort of cultural humility. And that is to sort of admit that we don't know what we don't know, right? And that, that's so uncomfortable for people. It's, 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 it's kind of more than nervous, you know? It's, it's terrifying for a lot of people. They're supposed to be in their place of comfort and expertise, uh, doing what they do best in the world that they're paid to make a living to do. And they're supposed to admit that they don't know a lot about it, like huge aspects of the cultural of uh, the cultural context in which they sit. And so I really think moving to this sort of cultural humility can get us to cultural proficiency because then we have to hire experts to do it, right? We have to hire, we have to admit that this is an expertise. And that's sort of what critical race theory in a way did in the legal profession. It's like, okay, we can't just be a civil rights lawyer anymore. There, you have to actually understand how race is operating in the law. Um, so that's how critical race theory can really sort of build in our public organizations. It's the same thing. You can't just be an equity scholar generally, but you have to, we have to have equity scholars. We also have to have equity scholars who look primarily at race and equity scholars who look primarily at gender. And we have to sort of combine all of these because this power operates in such a complex, multi-tiered way that it's impossible for us to disentangle it without a lot of minds, right? That's, we're social animals. We work together to solve these big problems. Um, and the best thing that critical race theory can really lend us in terms of substantive things that we can do is it can help us to start with our own organizations and think to ourselves, okay, you know, the school public administration here at, the, at UNO was started 50 years ago, right? So what was going on 50 years ago? There was a lot going on. There's a racial past to why this school is in place. It's not just that it happened to start the same year that the Black Studies program started here at UNO. This was in a context. And are we staying true to that background that the organization was originally built on? Or are we sort of uh, leaving that path, right? And we also think about there's a, schools, there's a school district out here that's called School District 66. Um, it's uh, near Omaha. And it, it's called 66 because it's created in 1966. So they divided out the school district in 1966. Now what's going on, you created your own school district in 1966. And I've talked to some of the folks who are in that school district and there's still a lot of questions that can be asked. And understanding that is more important than just understanding the history. Understanding, uh, for example, that the second amendment was added to the constitution primarily as a tool to put down slave insurrections helps us understand what the, how the second amendment moves through our legal system. And understanding why district 66 was created in 1966 under, helps us to understand the formal and informal, formal rules and informal norms that are still operating within that system. So we can start to dismantle things when we really put that critical eye into it. And white people can, do that by what I call positional advocacy, which is putting yourselves into the shoes, physically finding a space where you can stand next to shoulder to shoulder with whoever you're looking to advocate for and making their interests, your interests to the greatest extent possible. It makes it a lot easier to do the empathetic leap that you need to do to uh, actually imagine you're in someone else's shoes by trying to find a way to stand nearby. Yes, thank you so much. So we have just about seven minutes left. And now I'm gonna kind of get you guys to talk about, we know what the problem is. I'm gonna get you to talk about translating these ideas that we have into practice. And so discussing it from your own lens about, you know, specific strategies about how do we um, leverage and advance the work of CRT in these public organizations. And so um, I'm going to start with um, Dr. Tradia since I skipped her once before. <laughs> so let's start with her. So your question is, how do, can you say your question again, please? 
Yeah, so it's just a broad question really focused on solution. How do we translate these mm-hmm. ideas into practice? Ooh, uh, yeah, I, I think it is, I want to go back to what I said earlier. We need to do this work in solidarity and in a way that the solidarity is decolonizing, non-extractive to build on what my colleagues, Dr. Rollins, Dr. Heckler, Dr. McCandless have already shared that this solidarity, white people, people of color. And then again, none of these, we are not monolithic groups. Um, how do we engage in this work in solidarity from uh, from this acknowledgement of our own social locations and our own social positionality? So going through that clean pain work that Resma Menikam talks about, we can do this work and engage in dirty pain where we are living in uh, out of alignment of with our values, like not aligned with our values. And we could do this work and embrace that clean pain that comes with that processing of cognitive dissonance and how do we then show up? What is the energy that I'm bringing into this work as an individual, as an organization? What are my values? What are my organizational values? And doing this work in an integrated way is so important and not doing it again repetitively to again, am I doing this to support white comfort and dominant comfort or am I actually doing the work of building counter cultures to my organization? In doing all this work, I feel that the critical racist theories tenet of intersectionality is so important and so overlooked because it feels more complex and we we feel like we cannot really address intersectionality effectively. It is so important that we continue to do this work with intersectional lens so that we are not invisibilizing, marginalizing and erasing those who are the most vulnerable to be erased, especially BIPOC people with multiplied marginalized identities. Thank you so much. Um, what about you, Dr. Heckler? Yeah, thanks. I wanted to actually build on that. I was just saying, you know, and it's that iterative process that Dr. Trivia was talking about, where even once you've got it, you still have to go back to it. And that's because CRT teaches us that racism is permanent. It's built into the very structures since, you know, the, the um, you know, Jamestown colony when the when uh, I'm trying to remember the white lion, I think it is. 1619. 1619, right. The white lion landed in the Jamestown colony. Ever since then, it's been built into the system. And maybe even before that, because the very reason they were there was to stand on indigenous land, right? Um, so it's been built so far into this that we can not we can create a bubble of what Bell Hooks would call a home place, right? Um, but it's always going to be at tension with the larger society. Um, so for example, uh, for very, I wanna be really concrete here. Um, one thing we were talking about when we were discussing this panel is uh, doing a critical race financial literacy training. So we think about financial literacy, not just about how you can negotiate the economic system, which critical race theory would acknowledge is overwhelmingly whiteized. all right? And we can think about um, Darity, William Darity, if you want to read about this, like Darity, it just nails it. Uh, and how wealth is this structure of, of white systems, right? But if we start to think about how race influences what people are doing and, and the financial system, not just teach, here's what a mortgage is, but teach redlining and what a mortgage is, right? Not just teach credit cards, but teach um, the, the, all of the predatory lending practices and credit cards. Uh, not just teach student loans, but teach uh, segregation in student loans, you know? So, so we can actually go through the process of them understanding the financial system instead. So trying to be more complete in the way that we do our services as nonprofits. And then the other thing is to remember that um, white people have been the beneficiaries of de-wealthing of multiple groups of people for generations. And that means that white run nonprofits are going to be in a position to ask for wealthy funders more easily than other nonprofits. Nonprofits run by indigenous people, nonprofits run by black people or Asian people are going to be in a different position. Even though Asians have higher income, they still have lower wealth, right? So even in that situation, we have to think about black run nonprofits as doing a different kind of task and doing it in a different way. And Asian run nonprofits is doing a different kind of task and treat those differently. So this sort of gets into that intersectionality. People of color, 
was a very strategic term that was created to unite folks together in the civil rights movement. It's not a very good uh, analytic term, unless what you're trying to highlight is whiteness, because people of color are so broad, right? And that's sort of what the BIPOC term is getting. Um, so breaking that up into the intersectionality it helps us to better understand what's actually going on. And I'll leave it there because I know we're running out of time. Yeah, so we're out of time almost. Um, Dr. Rollins, you want to chime in quickly? Yes, very quickly. I would just say uh, we have to teach this stuff. We have to not just teach it as a module in our courses. Uh, we have to teach this as four courses that solely focus on racism and its impact on public administration. And when we're teaching in our, in our other courses, we have to be honest about public administration and be honest about the state of the field and, and uh, be very clear. Woodrow Wilson, although he was the father of the field, he held us back. His views held us back as a field. We have to be very critical and very uh, fair to history. And I, and I think uh, this is just something we could do. And I was going to talk more on it, but I don't want to uh, do that. I know Sean okay. probably wants some concluding words as well. <laughs> All right. Um, Dr. McCann, what you got for us? Um, and I, I just wanted to say, I just really like what you said, Dr. Rollins. Um, I, I know that Dr. Barry James has been sharing this in a few sessions. Be sure to read uh, the NASPA report that I just shared there because it gives a lot of ideas of various ways uh, to do this. But I, I think clearly um, there's a lot going in here, uh, changing our pedagogy and even making things like racial equity impact analyses um, assignments within courses to give uh, students the practice in, in, in doing that to, to, to center that. Yeah. And so my only comment is that we can't wait for other people to do this work. We have to do this work. And so what I love about this panel is that we're extremely diverse. Um, I recently, you know, met all these folks and I've had this a tremendous experience. Um, you know, ASPA, NASPA, NAPA, and all those other acronyms, the folks are doing the work. And so if you really want to be involved, get involved and um, challenge us to do more and to do better. I'll end my comments there, but just shout out to Dr. Um, Barry James for supporting us with um, just a tremendous amount of resources in the chat. Thank you to my colleagues on this panel. I'll be reaching out, looking forward to us writing a PA Times piece. Continue to talk about critical race theory. It is so important. We're never gonna make change in our society unless people like us are committed and do the work. So thank you for participating in this panel. It's been fantastic. Thank you guys. And shout out to my students who are here. I know you guys are in summer school, but hey, we're making it do what it do. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Lopez Littleton. Thank you. Uh,